Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we're going to do a raised bed gardening class and we're going to talk just briefly a little bit about raised beds and then we are going to demonstrate and actually construct one. So uh, we're glad you've joined us. Really quick, maybe just introductions. I'm David Rice with Weber Basin Water Conservancy District and Janice Terry is one of our co-hosts. She's our garden lead here at Jordan Valley, or not Jordan Valley, Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. And so um, we've also got Jonna Moon and she'll be helping us with our camera today. So we're, we're really glad you've joined us and uh, we're just looking forward to this. So as, as we've kind of done with this video format, um, there's a Q&A button. You should see a Q&A button. So because there's not a lot of interaction here, this, this kind of course could be a little bit challenging. But the Q&A button, if you'll use that to ask questions, uh, Janice will be following up, following those questions. And if we need to pause as we're going, as I'm demonstrating how to build one of these, we'll pause and address the questions. If it's something that can wait till the end, then we'll wait till the end and we'll address all the questions then. Um, you may have an option to raise hand um, we probably will just ignore the raise hand. So if you do that, just expect to be ignored. And we will address the questions as just through that Q&A. So type it in so that we can see the question. We'll, and Janice will answer those individually if they're simple to answer just one-on-one -on -one or like, like we said, we'll interrupt and, and pause and address those questions. So um, also just kind of as an introduction, uh, Weber Basin Water at our Learning Garden, we've historically hosted all these classes in person, uh, but because of the situation, we're trying to do as many of these online as possible. So stay tuned with our website, uh, with social media, with those avenues to know what we're planning. Uh, we've, we've got some good upcoming classes for the rest of this month, so go to the website for those. So without, uh, without any more introduction there, we're just going to jump right in to raise beds. Um, I've got I've got some slides that I'm going to show, and first we're just going to go through those quickly. And oh, that's not it. So let me. Sorry, we're we're adapting and learning technology as we go all the time, and so I'm going to just switch gears here. You're gonna you should be seeing some slides in just a second. Maybe there we go. So. Um, I'm hopeful that you're seeing those slides. So raised beds can take on many forms. Now, like I said, I'm going to I'm going to glide through these slides really quick. The reason I'm showing you these slides is really mostly just to show you some options. There's not a one way to do raised beds. You can do it out of all kinds of different materials, all kinds of shapes, sizes, heights. You know, there's not a limit to those. Now, there are some advantages and disadvantages. Anytime you raise something up. Um, it, it, it creates an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is you get improved soil drain, drainage. You've got uh, total control of what soil goes in there or soil media that goes in there. Um, you can increase and warm the temperatures earlier in the spring. Um, the maintenance on it, you know, the easy access, you can, you can really decorate them up nice. You can fit a lot of material in them. That's some, that's some advantages. Also irrigation methods. You can do some very good irrigation to really get only the plants you need water did not water everything else. Disadvantages, of course, initial work, the cost to construct, and then one of the disadvantages is also the, because it's above ground, it can dry out more quickly. And so you've just got to really watch the water, but if you've done the soil amendments, you've done some things that way, then you will not have to worry too much. You can, you can certainly manage it. You can grow a lot of different things. You can have strawberries in these. You can have any kind of vegetables. Corn is one that if you're going to grow corn, you may want to consider doing that in a bigger area. It needs a lot of space, needs a high nitrogen demand. I don't know that I would recommend corn in a raised bed, but almost everything else works. Here's just a little slide again to show some of the options of different shapes, um, sizes. You can be as small as a four by four type bed, as long as a 20 by four. Um, they can be four feet high, they can be six inches high, two feet high, completely up to you as far as you know the options and things you prefer in you know in your raised bed so here's just kind of a little cross section of, of one of these types of beds um, and and i had a question come in that are we going to address soil issues and i am i've got a little slide that will talk about some soil soil properties and different things you can do with soil just briefly but here's just a little cross section of how you might put some of this together 
Um, and this presentation is also being recorded. You can go back and reference it. We'll post the slides uh, so you can also refer to this a little bit later. In the meantime, I'll just keep going through some of these slides. Um, give me a second here. All right. So in our learning garden, this, this uh, slide here showed some raised beds that actually got taken out. Um, the building I'm sitting in now is sitting right here where these reds, raised beds were. But you can see these were about 18 inches tall. They had drip irrigation to them. Um, we, we planted all kinds of stuff in these. You can do them in little rows. You can clump things together. You can grow viney things, tomatoes, peppers. Right there on the corner, we had some herbs. That's a horseradish plant, some chives, and some sage. Um, you can do lots of different things in raised beds. They turn out very well. They can be very attractive. Or they can, they can be very, very basic just to get the elevation you need so you don't have to bend over to, to work with your crops. There's also the principles you've heard of square foot gardening. That's one method of raised bed gardening. We're not going to talk a lot about the principles of square foot gardening, but the idea is you, you put things into a grid, a, a 12 inch by 12 inch grid throughout the bed, and then you can plant certain numbers of plants within each of those 12 inches, as illustrated in this slide with the string, a little 12 inch grid. <clears throat> you can also do raised bed gardening without using any lumber, without doing things. This is a straw bale demonstration where they use straw bales, put some soil media in the middle. Those straw bales will break down. And over time, as they break down, they're just creating compost. They're creating a very fertile, loamy material. And then you can continue to just recycle that back into a bed the next year. So you start with new straw bales, you water those, they're breaking down, and you just perpetually do that kind of over and over and over. Um, some people that might really appeal to them, others not so much. Um, a couple slides here. With a raised bed, you can create low tunnels. So you, you put in some pipe as a sleeve, and then you can use a flexible, like either a flexible PVC or some sort of flexible metal, metal conduit or, or, or other material to create hoops over the top, which can extend your growing season on the early end and the late end. Um, so with that raised bed, it gives you that option. Then you can cover that, you can uncover it, you can remove those in the summer as your produce gets big. Um, another method of raised beds is simply no, no edges at all. You simply just mound up the soil gives you some of the similar benefits of getting the temperatures raising early, getting good drainage, uh, being able to mend the soils and change the soil properties just a little. Um, here's one, um, corrugated metal. You know, there, there may be some pros and cons to this depending. Of course, if it's done right, they'd be strong, they'd be durable, they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't rot over time. Your challenge might be if they're in a really hot location, that metal might heat up, it might change the temperatures of the soils a bit. Um, it's hard to say, just depending on the site, depending on your situation, but I have seen those in real life and I, I think if done correctly, they could work out very well. Here's an example of that, you know, with soil in it, uh, with some wood, wood trim. Of course, it looks great. Um, just an advantage, getting it up off the ground. You could use cinder block. Um, a bit more work you, to really hold those together with that soil pushing on the edge. If they were just a couple layers high, it's probably not going to be a big deal. The higher you go, there'd be more soil pressure pushing those out. You'd either need to mortar them together, fill them with concrete or something of that nature. Um, this, this is kind of that artificial trex decking material, you know, and, and you can find kits online that have all kinds of options and the different brackets, materials and things. So you could create our very artistic things and just put flowers in them, put vegetables in them. Well, there's lots of options for this, um, but you know, we're going to keep for this, for this class and what we're demonstrating, I'm going to show you a simple wood uh, model, <clears throat> one method of doing that. Um, so we're not going to get into any of this, the pre pre made kits or anything. Although, you know, Costco, Sam's club, some of those places sell them. They may have white vinyl material, not a bad idea. It, it's a material that will work. It's just personal preference. Um, what you really want, what your style, what, what's going with it in your yard, where the location is, all those things to consider when you're constructing the raised bed or, or planning to have one. Here's a couple a slide with very simple raised beds. You know, just one layer high, it gets the soil up a bit, very easy to manage. I mean, this is, they're not even completely full of soil, but, you know, very easy to manage something like this. Um, it's just a personal option, very decorative. It looks very nice. I think if it, if it were me, I would have had those completely full of soil though. So it's easier to cultivate the soil, easier to work with, so you're not actually just bending over a board to get to your stuff. <clears throat> um, 
just again, just another quick example, decorative, different layers. Here's one that shows a couple layers, very simple, no top edge. Um, you, you can see the, tr the trellising, kind of the metal in there to help viney things climb. Again, you don't have to worry about viney things going across the soil. You can actually train them to go upwards. And that's what, in a raised bed with limited space, that's what you'd want to do. So you, you build these trellising structures and very attractive. They can be very showy. Um, <clears throat> here's one that shows a little bit of how they put a, a drip line, an irrigation line in the middle of that. Um, again, these are just examples. And I'm going to talk about a lot of this stuff and then we're going to just get into the building of one. But I'm not going to get into the depth of all the options of, of everything. These are just example slides. Of, of different options to give you ideas. You know, and I apologize, some of these pictures are just a tad blurry. That's what happens when you find free pictures on the internet. <laughs> when, you don't, when you don't have perfect options and you just find free pictures. Um, here's one where they've actually got like, it looks like a shrubby vine growing in that raised bed. And it's more of a permanent structure uh, next to a trellis, an arbor, something pergola. You could use beams, old ties. Now railroad ties, there's some controversy around that. You're going to have to do your own homework. Um, railroad ties are treated with creosote and you know there's the, the verdict is out. I think some would say don't ever use that. That can leach into the soil. Others will say no, it's fine. Do your own homework if you want to use railroad ties. Um, if, if It's completely up to you. There is some documentation. I know that many of the horticulture or land grant universities like Utah State University Extension and other state extensions have done publications on the use of railroad ties. So I'm just, just do your own homework on those. I'm not going to say pros or cons on that, but it is an option. It is a material. Uh, you just need to decide for yourself with that. Here's another example of a simple bed using a pipe, just a pipe clamped on the inside before you put the soil in, preparing to have it turn into a low tunnel or you can bend a PVC pipe. Now, if, you, if your bed is too narrow, you're not gonna be able to bend a pipe like that. It'll, it'll break that pipe unless you use something a bit more flexible than PVC. But a three quarter inch PVC pipe, you can usually get a, enough bend on that potentially to, to go all the way over. Others have done this where instead of having a pipe in the ground, they have a piece of rebar where that slides inside the pipe rather than putting the pipe inside of the sleeve. So that, just a way to, again, to extend your growing season early and potentially extend your growing season late to prevent from frost damage. Other timbers, you know, this could be very attractive, thick timbers, nice timbers. Um, some of this just comes down to cost. How much do you want to spend? Is the resource available? Maybe somebody's tearing down some structure and you have easy access to some older, older lumber, old barn wood or something. Um, whatever you can use would be fine. While I think while I'm talking about that, um, and this slide kind of illustrates two things, but while I'm talking about wood, um, woods do have a life expectancy that can vary. You will want to use a wood that is a little bit more rot resistant. Redwood naturally will rot slower, so will cedar. If you use Douglas fir or pine, those will have a tendency to rot more quickly. Um, Treated lumber, pressure treated lumber you could use, but again, that's one of those questionable things, the pros and cons of potential chemical leaching into the soil. That would be a personal preference for you and a decision you have to make. It would resist rot longer, but you have to do a little homework and, and weigh out the pros and cons. So with this slide, I wanted to show this, there's a no-no as far as in my book, they're putting plastic in the bottom of the bed. Don't put plastic in the bottom of your raised bed. Now, granted, we want to prevent weeds, maybe weed, weed intrusion or, or different things from coming in. Plastic will prevent water from moving, moving through the bed as well as weeds coming in, but you don't want water prevention. You don't want this becoming a bathtub and holding water. You want water to be able to move all the way through and drain away, um, especially if you have a heavier soil underneath. You just want, you want water to move out of the bed. So if you are worried about weed intrusion, use a weed fabric, a commercial grade weed fabric, or use something that'll biodegrade over time. Use cardboard, use several thick layers of newspaper. Um, those will break down, but they do serve as a great weed barrier initially. Uh, kind of, they form a nice mat, but they do allow water percolation and a little bit of air movement through. Um, 
again, just a nice illustration, nice shot of a, a decorative raised bed. You can stain these up really nice. They can be kind of a structural element in your yard. And this, this ties into a little bit of local scapes, what we've, with some of the principles that we've talked about in other classes where you're looking for functional outdoor rooms of your yard. Well, raised beds is one of the elements that you could incorporate to make a very functional space that's not being irrigated with lawn, it's not, it's not lawn, it's using less water than lawn because you're targeting the irrigation. You know, it can be very attractive, very functional piece in your landscape. Here's another one that's just like that, a very functional, very decorative, um, very interesting, you know, format or layout for your yard. Now again, this requires a little bit more thought to design beds that are not square, not rectangle, you're angled and stuff. So you'd, you'd put a little more thought into that, you'd do a little calculation, you'd figure that out, but all of this stuff can be done. Um, you can do most of it yourself. You don't even need to pay anybody. Here's a little terrace bed. The advantage of this is probably mostly decorative. You're not really increasing the volume, the capacity for plant material, you're just simply increasing the depth. So it's more about the visual appeal. Um, this might be really attractive up against a structure or where you need some a little height or something. So. Um, again, it's just using your creativity, using the materials you have on hand and, you know, creating something cool. And that, again, you could use old scrap lumber. If, if all you have available is some scrap lumber, two by fours or two by sixes, two by eights of, of pine, you can use those. Just expect that they won't probably last as long as a redwood or cedar material would. Um, here, this slide, simple. It's a tiny little box. You could grow a few vegetables in there. This have some cool season crops of kale and some other lettuce and stuff. This is just an old um, ammo box. Um, it's like 12 inches wide and three feet, three feet long or so. And it's small, but it's portable. You can move that thing around. You can move it from your deck. You can put it in the shade. Um, so be creative. You know, think, of, think out of the box a little bit. It, this isn't rocket science. You know, you're not, you, you can't really fail too miserably. I suppose you could fail, <laughs> but you won't fail too miserably. Um, it's worth trying anything you, anything you have if you're interested in this. Now, if you ha live in an area prone to animals, this is one option for that. You can build a little structure around your bed and put wire around it. Keep deer out, keep rabbits out, keep, you know, whatever. You, you could put a, whatever type of wire you feel is necessary to keep animals out without necessarily having to build a 10 foot fence around your entire yard. So if gardening is a problem for you with deer and others, other animals, um, raised beds, you don't even, I guess you don't even have to do a raised bed. You could build a fence around another bed, but um, anyway, you could, you could look at an option like this. So um, again, here's another little fenced one. This wouldn't keep deer out, but it might keep smaller animals out. Um, it's just mostly decorative. Here's something, you know, if you need something really elevated, you could put it on legs. You could basically raise your garden, put it on stilts. If you happen to be maybe wheelchair bound or something, you could pull right up to this. You could, you could still play in the soil. You could harvest your produce. Um, so again, options are really kind of endless. And even here, sandbags. If you've got nothing else, build it out of sandbags. If you build a nice little structure, you can grow anything. Um, here's a slide we've shown in other, other presentations about the coverings. Um, spun bonded polyester or remade material makes a great cover, a shade cloth, as well as can help with frost control if it's just a light frost. Low tunnels, I've kind of briefly talked about these. They heat up quickly. They're not tall or you're not meant to get inside of them, but they can certainly help extend a growing season in a raised bed. Um, garden tunnels. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but it is here in the presentation. So you build a little raised bed, you basically put a mini greenhouse on top of it. So I'm going to transition here to soil. And I know there's, there may be lots of questions. The initial slides here were really meant to just give you some ideas, let you know that the options are out there. You don't have to get stuck in, in just a simple square or rectangle type um, pattern or, or whatever. If you want to do a raised bed, you'd have limited space in your yard there's many options and many ways to do this. So let's talk about um, soil for a minute. The calculating of the need, first of all, how much do you need? If you're building the box, you think, well, how much soil will fit in that box? Here's a little formula for you. Uh, for square rectangular boxes, you're gonna simply go length times width and times the depth in inches. 
divide that by 324, that will give you a cubic yard number. So if you need to buy soil and they say, well, how many cubic yards do you need? Um, that little formula right there will give you the cubic yard number. If you have some sort of other shape, triangle or circle, here's the formula. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going into those, but here's the mathematical calculations you need to figure out your cubic yardage for the soil media you need, okay? Um, and as I mentioned, this slide, we, we will post the slide, we will repost the presentation. So as I move on, you know, if you're, if you're stuck on that and you're like, oh no, I didn't get that written down. Well, it'll be posted. You can go back and look at these and, and get what you need. So that becomes important because usually in a raised bed, you, you're not just putting your regular garden soil or topsoil or, you know, whatever you find in it. Ideally, you want to use a soil media or at least mix the soil media with natural soil. Now soils, soil properties are, are interesting. There's, there's chemistry of soil, there's texture of soil, and there's nutrients in soil. Um, so if you really wanna know what your soil is, if you feel like, well, I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't have money to pay for soil, I'll just use what I have, it would probably be worth, now I have a cost on here, but that cost has changed. I think they now ch charge about 20 bucks, $25 to do a very comprehensive soil test through Utah State University Extension. Um, they, you send a soil sample on, they will send you back the report that tells you all the, the soil composition, the soil chemistry, and then a, a nutrient recommend, recommendation or fertilizer recommendation to make sure that soil is adequately fertile. And it, it's worth the money if you have no idea what your soil is. So one reason that raised beds are an advantage is you can take the guesswork out of the soil because you can put in the, any soil or soil media um, and, and you have complete control. There's no weed seed in it. You know what the soil texture is. You know what the nutrients are. And so you, basically you're putting in an artificial soil. And sometimes those soil mixes can be um, peat moss, vermiculite, and compost. In a, in a equal combination of those. Now, if you want to add a little bit of soil into that, you would add some natural soil. And if, if you can't add any of that other stuff, ideally you add natural soil and compost. Compost is going to make better soil out of any of your natural soil types. So if you have clay, add compost, it'll improve it. If you have sand, add compost and you'll improve it for nutrients, for water holding, for water drainage, for all of the options. Um, so if you can't do anything more, please add compost to lighten up the soil, incre increase the nutrients, and improve overall you know, success of the raised beds. If you can do artificial, like an artificial soil media, compost, vermiculite, and peat moss, um, and then compost would be the ingredient that you would add in every year, because that'll slowly break down, that'll slowly kind of you know, be used, the nutrients will be used, compost continues to break down. So you just add compost every single year to your raised bed and, you know, keep the nutrient levels up each, each year. <clears throat> so I see that there's just a couple of questions and I can probably answer these before we move on. One of them was, um, would putting weed berry or newspaper or cardboard prevent plants with deeper roots from um, sending their roots deep? If, you're, if your uh, raised bed is only six inches deep, <clears throat> the answer to that is it may prevent, it may have a little, create a barrier. So your deeper rooted, rooted plants, like maybe a tomato plant or something would try to send roots deeper than six inches likely. Um, and so it, it's not going to be a problem usually unless you have the, the bed super packed full of plants. The, the roots can spread, you know, horizontally across the ground and into that bed. And so the, the, the square foot gardening principles, for example, um, they only recommend six inches and everything fits and everything roots into that six inches. So it's not a big deal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry a, a tremendous amount about raised bed or cardboard underneath preventing things from going down. Ideally, you're just preventing weeds and things from coming up. And that's what, that's the purpose of that. If any, you don't have to use a weed barrier. It's just an option. I've done some raised beds. I didn't put a weed barrier under mine. You know, you get an 18 inch raised bed. It's, you usually don't have any problems. I would say though, if you have notorious problems with field bindweed, also referred to as morning glory, the morning glory can go up into that and it will surface at the top and it'll go all the way through 18 or 24 inches of soil and, 
and you'll get morning glory or field bindweed in your raised bed. It's just what's going to happen. Your weed barrier might prevent that. I have seen where morning glory roots go underneath the weed barrier and they kind of, they're trying to find light and so forth to come up and the weed barrier helps prevent them from surfacing. So it can help a little bit. Once it can use soil pep to fill the raised bed with, um, I wouldn't just fill it with straight soil pep because that's really just basically composting or it's breaking, it's broken down material that's still decomposing. So it's pretty much just straight compost. I would add, <clears throat> excuse me, I would add something else to it. Um, add a little bit of natural soil to it. Add something like that, um, peat moss, vermiculite, or something to help give you the kind of a, a stability to the soil over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, how quick? One one more question is how quickly does um, Douglas fir rot? Um, it's not going to be a year. There's many factors that are going to contribute to that, so I can't really give you a number. Um, some of that's going to be moisture. If it's always wet and touching up against that soil, of course, that's going to speed the decomposition. Um, so I would think you're going to get several good years out of it. Um, just, just experience with wood in the ground. You're going to get a good few years, at pro probably five years, maybe five years plus, depending on, again, the site, the condition. <clears throat> you're going to get several good years out of it. So that's what I mean. If you're, if you're super worried about some of that, don't worry too much. You may have to replace some boards as time goes on and kind of reconstruct your bed, but don't, don't worry too much. If Douglas fir is what you've got, then use it. All right, so <clears throat> I'm just about through with these slides, <clears throat> and then we're going to move on and we're going to just demonstrate how to build this. Uh, a few soil amendments, compost, of course, if you can compost some things, manures, you always use aged manures, sawdust, sawdust will continue to break down, wood chips, all these things with this, the little asterisk by it, those need additional nitrogen to continue to break them down. So if you're using those in any raised bed or regular garden, um, add some extra nitrogen to that to help speed up the composition and also so that your plants are not starving for nitrogen um, as, they're, as this other material is trying to break down. Um, you can add for a water holding, if you need a little water holding capacity, Coconut husk, also referred to as coconut core, um, has great water holding capacity. It's often used in container plantings, uh, your, your decorative pots. And so it's a great additive to add into soil, uh, soil media in a raised bed as well for soil, soil moisture holding. And again, because they're out of the ground, these beds can dry out more quickly. So if you have a little extra water holding capacity, that's gonna be a benefit. <clears throat> All right, so here's that, here's that mix, the soil mix for if you're doing kind of a square foot gardening principle. And this is really kind of a general good idea. You know, you're mixing one third peat moss, vermiculite, blended compost. Now, this says if it's a depth of only six inches, you know, there's no need to fertilize because the compost is providing the nitrogen. But again, if, if your bed is small and your water, depending on your watering, you may need to add additional fertilizer just to keep the fertility level high. You would always want to add compost every year to bring nitrogen and nutrients back in. But if you don't have enough, then you will need to add extra fertilizer. Ideally, you're not walking in your raised beds because that just compacts and compresses the soil. Now granted, if you have a natural garden, you're out there, you're gardening, you're doing your thing, you're walking in it. Raised beds, if you add all this artificial, you know, the artificial soil media, you don't want it, you want it light and loose, you don't want it compacted tight. So ideally you're not in your raised beds too often. If you have to get in there and turn the soil a little bit, it's not a big deal. Um, now I'm gonna move on. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with that one. I'll just leave that slide there. Uh, for fertilization. Just remember the numbers. The first number on a bag is nitrogen, second number on the bag, phosphorus, the third one, potassium. And here on this slide, it lists what each of those are for. Nitrogen is green, it's green growth. That's why your grass loves nitrogen. It's just green growth. Phosphorus is used for blooms and fruiting. Potassium is uh, helps plants convert sugars and starches, um, convert nutrients into sugars and starches and just kind of overall plant health rooting and fruiting as well phosphorus and potassium. But um, if your plants are struggling, then add a little extra fertilizer, but don't overdo it. Just because you think a little good is good as a lot is not better. So let's move quickly to irrigation. And then I wanna leave plenty of time to build these. So with irrigation, ideally in a raised bed, the best way to go is use some sort of a drip irrigation. 
you can overspray, you can spray a bed, you can have spray heads on those and spray it. But as plants grow, your foliage, you're going to end up with blocked spray head, blocked spray pattern. So you, plants within the middle of the bed may not be getting adequate water. So use a trickler drip tape, use um, drip emitters that can direct plant, direct the water directly to individual plants within that bed. You can use soaker hoses. Ideally, it, soaker hoses aren't great because they don't have equal distribution, but if you snake the soaker hose around in that raised bed, it'd probably be sufficient if that's what you've got. Um, spray systems also water everything, including weeds, and can increase the fungus issues that may continue to contribute to rotting your bed, increasing that rot thing faster, um, overspraying, which means you have weeds outside your bed that are growing that you maintain, um, or you could water by hand. But make sure in a raised bed, if you're doing vegetables, they definitely need more water than in the ground because it dries out. I can't stress that enough. Here's a couple examples of some drip tubing. One's uh, drip, drip tape. The black there is drip tape, also referred to as trickle tape. And the one in the middle there is inline drip tubing. There's a couple brands, uh, manufacturers make this, but one of the name brands that a lot of people refer this to as is Netafim. Um, and I put that rotten tomato on this picture because if you don't get a good consistent watering, you'll get blossom end rot in your tomatoes. That's usually a function of some inconsistent watering patterns. I mean, there's a few varieties resistant to that, but if you start seeing that it's, it's an inconsistent watering that leads to that due to some calcium and so forth. So with that, I'm gonna turn, the, turn this laptop over to Janice and I'm gonna switch gears and I'm going to get ready to, to demonstrate how to raise a bed here. And uh, then we'll, add, we'll continue to ask or answer questions as we go. And uh, so I'm going to just stay tuned here. I'm just going to switch seats and we'll get going with me uh, demonstrating how to construct a bed. There may be one other. How's that? It's still too echoey. Let's just turn this down just a little. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So I'm maybe Janice, if you'll mute that or turn that one down a little bit until you're ready to answer a question. That'll help. <clears throat> All right, so what I've got in front of me here, and I, I, I hope you can see this. Janice, are you seeing this on the, you're not seeing this? You're not seeing me or you're still seeing you? Okay, oh, sorry. Sorry, everybody. Hit the stop share. Stop sharing there. There we go. Okay, now you should now you should be able to see me over here with our little our setup. You got it, Janice. You're good. You see it. Okay. So here in front of me, we've got. We're just going to demonstrate how to build one example. Now, before we start building one, and Jana, if you can make sure and see this. So I've already pre-constructed one bed. So here's an example. This is a this is a simple four by four structure. Um, we decided to put a little top on it because then the top makes it easy to sit, you know, and this is a small enough bed you can reach no matter where you're sitting around this bed, you can reach to the middle. So it makes it very easy to maintain, you know, if you, if you have a difficulty getting up and down, you, nice edge to sit on. Now you could build this exact same structure without a top edge and it saves, it saves a little money because you're not buying that extra lumber. But that's just one thing to consider in, you know, the aesthetic appeal, and what you choose to do with this. So now today, I've got a set of plans and I've posted it on our website. So um, <clears throat> so what, what I've got is I've got this, this set of plans. If you're interested in this very bad, now I've made a few modifications and I'll talk about them as we go. But this was just a free, this was a free plan on the website that I found called Chief's Shop. I don't know who he is, but it's a free plan. 
And the, the ideal part of this plan is it lists all the materials. So it lists the number of boards you need, it lists everything you need, and then on the plan itself, it has a cutting pattern. So I, I did this one to, so it would be easy for some of you if you're thinking, well, I don't know how many boards I need, I don't know what I need to cut, how long. This one has a very simple cutting pattern, shows you exact dimensions of everything. So that's why I chose to use this one. For those of you that you know, don't want to do this or you, or you think, oh, I need a bigger bed, you can make modifications to this type of a plan very simply and very easily. So um, with, with that, um, just a few basic things I wanted to show you. If you're gonna start, so what I have done is I've pre-cut all this lumber to make this go faster. If we were cutting the lumber, this might be a, a two hour project to cut everything, to you know, assemble it all together. So when I was cutting lumber, we just used a simple little carpenter's triangle. You know, it gives you a 45 degree angle, nice little edge, you got a marking pencil. So you know, to cut angles, like I did with the top here, you can use that kind of a tool. Um, all the rest of it, they're just straight cuts. So this helps you get good 90 degree angles. You'll use a circular saw if you have one, a miter saw, a, cross, a chop saw, cross cut saw to cut all this. If you only have a hand saw, it's definitely doable. It's just gonna be a little bit more sweat on your part to cut all this stuff up. So, um, I want to mention just quickly on some screws. You know, you can use all kinds of screws. There's a lot available. We're just going to use a, a, a little screw like this. This one's coated and it's meant for outdoor use. You could use any kind of decking type screw. Usually they're coated in a material that prevents them from rusting and breaking apart. Because um, over time, that metal exposed to the elements will all and these screws can just break in half. And so over time, your screw might rust through and a board might come loose because it's just simply rusted through with the screw. So this is a coated screw. You can buy these anywhere at Home Depot, Lowe's, or you know, any hardware store. Any kind of decking outdoor screw meant for lumber. Um, so as we go, I'm gonna show you how to do this. I also have, I've got a couple tools here. I've got a drill with a drill bit. You can just use an eighth, an, eight, an eighth inch bit just to get enough of a little pilot hole. So as you're going into some of these, some lumber has a tendency to split and because you're putting the screws on the very edge, um, you can get splitting. The screw goes in, applies a little pressure and the board just splits apart a little bit. Um, to me, it's just unsightly. Um, it's, it's not always a problem in an outdoor raised bed, but to me, I just like to drill just a quick little pilot hole. And then you can put the screws in and they're gonna, it's gonna look good and it's gonna hold up very well. It helps the screws go in just a little faster as well. Now we're using redwood. Um, we're gonna actually put these beds in our, in our learning garden here. So if you wanna see these in real life, you're welcome to come up here to our learning garden. Here in a few weeks, we'll get some of these filled. We'll, we'll have four of them, we'll get them filled up with soil and we'll have them available for you to see. Um, we'll also get the irrigation to them so you can see how we're irrigating them you can get some ideas. If, if you're not in a hurry to do this, we're still a little ways out. And with the, the COVID-19 situation, you know, not everybody's working right now from here. Some are working from home. Anyway, it's a, it's a situation we haven't got all these ready yet. But, okay, with that, I think also, if you didn't want to follow the plan, this plan, you know, make up your own plan. I did want to quickly just talk about ways you can do a corner. Now, in this, this is just a piece of a four by four post. And here's a couple examples. These are two by six boards. You can see on this one, there's no, there's no rough edge anywhere. It's because the corner has been mitered so that the, those two pieces fit together. And it makes just one seam on the corner here. Whereas you can just butt boards up together, but it leaves one rough edge on the edge here. See this side, it looks fine, but you, you know, on this edge, but either way is fine. The, the bed will hold together. This is simply an aesthetic quality. If you don't have the tools to be able to miter those edges, so the 45 degree angles fit together nicely, this is completely adequate. And it'll hold your bed together just fine. So here's, here's what it looks like from the top. You know, here's what it looks like from the top, top or bottom, depending on what you see. So, but in this, the bed we're gonna build today actually any of these because the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna use little, what they call cleats on the back, and we're gonna put the boards against the cleat, which then 
allows you, to, I'll show you on this one, I pre-assembled one of these. So this is our four by four post. Here's our little cleat. What we're gonna do is we're gonna screw the boards from the back into our front boards. So you won't actually see any of the screws on the outside and you don't need to worry about the corners because this board is gonna just butt up right against there. And so it creates a very nice front look just as you can see on, on our raised bed here. So anyway, we're, the bed we're building today will do that. So it kind of hides some of the, the structural difficulties of hiding screws and hiding corners. You're not getting those corners perfect. So I think with that, we'll just jump right in here. We're gonna get started with the, the panels and I'll, I'll try to step you through this. So if you need, you can go back to the video, you can watch this again later and you can construct this yourself. So what I've done is I pre-assembled two of these and we're gonna assemble the whole thing. By the time we're done today, we'll just have the whole thing. Oh, I almost forget, I get so excited, I jump ahead of myself. So the plan that I'm doing today, we've made one modification. We added one extra set of boards to increase the height. The plan only makes this two layers of two by sixes, so about 12 inches. We thought we wanted to elevate them a little higher, so we bought an extra set of boards to add a two by eight in the middle to give it that extra height. Um, and then with that extra height, we also use a two by eight on the top for seating area. Okay, so if you, if you follow the plan directly, you're gonna end up with a 12 inch high um, raised bed with a two by six top, which is still very adequate. Um, a raised bed that I've got at home has a two by six area uh, seat on it. It looks nice, it's very functional. We sit on it, we grow strawberries and herbs on those and, and they're great. But if you wanna add a little extra height, you're gonna need um, two extra boards, two extra two by sixes or two extra two by eights for just the panels around the side to give you extra height. If you have questions about that, you can you know, email us or, or so forth. So with this, Right now, so I'm, I'm gonna start building this. And so what I'm gonna do, oops, this is gonna go. So I'm taking two, I'm taking two two by six boards. And I kind of look at these, I pre-cut these, but I wanna look at the nicest side. So I wanna put the nicest side down. I'll just take those away for a minute. And I'm gonna need two of these right now. So I'm just, whatever I want to look at the, night, the most, I'm going to put that face down because that's going to actually be the front of the bed. So this one, that's a nice side. They're both nice sides on this one. So, so I kind of just line those up. Now, <clears throat> rather than use the ones I've built, maybe I'll just show you how I built those. So I pre-cut the four by four post. So here's a four by four post and I've pre-cut a couple of two by two, two by two pieces. So well, I'll just show you how, to, how I built these cleats and then how we'll attach them to make a panel. And then we'll repeat that with these other two I've already built. We'll repeat that one two more time and we'll set up four sides and we'll be able to put this thing together. So again, thinking about your post, you want the, probably the nicest corner out. These go on the, on the opposite. So if this is my nicest corner, these are gonna to attach to the, the other back corner. So I can lay those out. And this is where I'm gonna just pre-drill just a couple little holes because a two by two will easily split apart. So I'm just gonna pre-drill some holes here. These don't have to go super deep into the other thing even, the other board. And I've got my box of screws here. So basically I'm using two drills because I don't want to swap the bits back and forth. Um, but if you don't have two drills, you can pre-drill all your holes at once and then just swap the bit and then assemble together. But for the sake of what we're doing, I'm just, I've just got two different drills. So we'll just put the screws in here. So I've pre-drilled three holes and I line, make sure I kind of line that up. Now, let me put in one more screw and then I'll say something else here. Now, when I went to buy this lumber, I couldn't find two by twos. I happened to have a table saw, so I made my own. I just bought a two by four and I cut it in half. So you can do that as well. Um, there's nothing magical about that. If you didn't have a two by 
two, you could probably use a two by four. The hard part is screwing them in here gets a little wide. So look for a two by two. If you can't find redwood in two by twos, use your Douglas fir, use something else that you can find um, to make these cleats. Or you'll have to just think of a different way to build the to build bed part, this cleat part. Um, so again, I'm just kind of lining that up. I'll get my drill bit here, one eighth inch, one eighth inch bit. And that, see that may just slide a little bit. It's not gonna be critical. There's no particular specific measurement you need on these. Um, you're just attaching it with three screws. So if it, you know, the idea though is you wanna make sure they're right at the back of the four by four post. Okay, so I've got, I've got one of those made, one of the new ones made. Let me go ahead and quickly just make the other one. And I'll try it again. I want to find the, to me, whatever is the most attractive side out. Now, I happen to be doing this inside of our conference room to eliminate some outside noise. Likely, you will be doing this outside and you know, I'll have to vacuum up this room when I'm done. But you can do this out on your patio or out on your grass. Um, if, if you don't like to be on your knees, I did bring a little knee pad here. You know, if, it, if it's hard, bring, get a little knee pad for yourself. It'll make it easier because you are kind of down on the ground. There's really not a, an easy way to do this other than to be on the ground on your hands and knees. You know, it makes it easier. Suppose if you had some really good workbench or table, you could do it that way. And I, I think I mentioned that our bed is 18 inches tall. Um, total height. So I cut, I cut these posts, these pieces at 18 inches. So whatever height you decide, that's what you want to make sure and cut your, your posts and your little cleats to that exact same height. Sometimes you'll hit a hard spot or not. And if your board starts to push up, just undo the screw a little bit, put in a reverse undo, and then give a little pressure on your board and, and screw again and it usually goes in. Okay, so now that, now that those are all done, let's get back to this, uh, to the little panel piece here. So I've, I've chosen the three boards for this side panel. Now, Here's, here's my outside corner. And on this one, here's my outside corner. So basically, now you just have to set this on here and on here. Although it looks like my pieces are just back a little bit. So what I'm gonna do to make sure this is snug, I'm just gonna get a different board. This will just help. I'm just gonna get a different board to make sure that's nice and snug and tight. So as I'm putting screws through here to the backside, that it's gonna fit nice and tight. So, so it's just like this. Okay, so I'm kind of lining things up. And once again, because it's a two by two, I'm just gonna drill three quick little pilot holes. And actually on this one, I'm gonna drill four because we're 18 inches high and there's that bigger board in the middle. So I'm basically one screw per board and two screws in the bigger board. So that was all nice and snug up against the edge. All my boards are straight.
Okay, so there's, we can turn that up a little bit like this. So there's one that's on, and if you see from the other side, you know, that, there's a little gap right there. Some of that could be in my cutting of my boards, but that's what that's gonna look like. Let me, well, you know, for ease, I guess, of showing the camera here, I'll flip this whole thing around this way. Yeah, my, it looks like I got off just a little on my edges. <clears throat> But like I said, because it's not because it's not rocket science, I'm okay with a I'm okay with a half an inch um, being off. So, are we having a little camera difficulty? <laughs> oh, okay. We'll get it. We'll get the camera going again. So, sorry. Occasionally we have little glitches, and uh, that's just how it is with technology and video. You're gonna have little things that come and go like that. So. In this one, I've already pre-drilled a couple holes on this one, so I'm just gonna drill one more. And then we just, we'll put our screws in here. And, <clears throat> and I'm making sure I get this as flat as possible so that it sits on the ground nice and, it, and the top will sit on it nicely as well. <laughs> Now, there's probably some of you that are like master carpenters out there, and you might be thinking, what in the world? You know, I'm an amateur. I don't do carpentry for a living. But I'd like to think I know a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully you master carpenters, if you can give me tips, give me tips. All right, so there, so there's one panel, and you can kind of, you know, I'll back it up here a little bit. So that's one side panel. Now, the plan that I, the plan that I made or we copied, it actually shows some little decorative squares that you can put on here if you want. Uh, for this, I'm not going to worry about that. We're just going to skip that for now. So I'm just going to set this one off here to the side. And then we're going to do the next, we're going to do a next one here. Same, same concept. I'm going to take two two by twos or two by, excuse me, two by two, two two by sixes. And I'm choosing the best side. And then I'm going to take one of my two by eights. And I just try to make sure and line them up the best I can right there. And once again, take the, the cleat that you've made and put it on top there. Okay, and then for sake of camera, I'll just flip this around. You can hopefully see what I'm doing. Now, occasionally your boards might be a little warped. So what I'll do is I might, I'm gonna probably put a screw in one and then try to push it that way a little bit and tighten it up so I don't have a, a big crack once I get it all together. But I can still, you know, the pilot holes. The pilot holes are mostly for the two by two. They really don't need to go into the other piece. I mean, occasionally the tip of that screw might crack the one on the back side, but I haven't really seen that to be a problem for me. So that, I'm just gonna try to pull that together just a little as I screw it together. All right. Yeah. 
Okay, so I've got two down and I've got the, the cleats on both of them, on both of these edge pieces. So this is where it can get a little bit tricky, not super tricky because these aren't super, super heavy. Now, if you were doing this with eight foot long, if you wanted a four by eight bed or something, you're doing the same thing. This little part might here might, might get more tricky. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna get two of my two of my two by six boards, choose the best sides. This one's got a big knot and kind of a chunk in it, but that's still the best side. Occasionally, too, you'll get some sap. That is very sticky. If you touch it, it'll get all over you. So watch for that if you don't like to get sap and sticky mess. So again, I've lined up the edges the best I can. So this is sometimes where you could, you can do this by yourself, but sometimes you may need a hand. So you're not going to probably see me putting screws in. Maybe I should do it the other way. Um, I'll do that so you can see this without having to move the camera around too much. I'll just shift my board to the back side here. And so I'll line these up and then I'll just use, I'll just use this other piece. So, sorry, I'm old and out of breath. So bear with me if I'm huffing and puffing here. So then you're just basically lining this up and it'll sit there because there's plenty of weight. The idea is you just have to lightly hold it so it doesn't fall that direction and you can do the same thing. Just put in a couple little pilot holes. Now, if you're, if you're not comfortable with just one screw in each of these, um, Add, add some more. I mean, it, it's your bed. If you want to double up those screws, put two in each for sure, then certainly do that. So this is where I want to make sure, again, just before I start putting the screws in, just make sure it's nice and snug. And see, that one did actually kind of split that board a little bit. So there's that one. Now what I'm gonna do, now rather than move that board, I have another one sitting here. So I'm just gonna elevate these and I'll just do the same thing on this other side. And that, that's holding. I don't wanna put a lot of pressure and break it that direction, but it'll hold just fine. And this size, like I said, if you are doing this the other way, one idea too is you can leave the panels down and add the boards this way and just put screws. You know, if you were doing this, you would just put a screw in this way. I just find it easier with more pressure, more leverage to go down instead of pushing sideways. So you can do it that way. But this seems to just be pretty fast, pretty easy. You don't have to apply nearly as much pressure trying to put the screw in. So I'll just talk about costs. Okay, so Janice asked me to talk about costs for a second. Um, let me drill some pilot holes and then I'll talk about costs. Because I don't want it to be noisy while I'm here. So, okay, for, for this exact bed that we're building, with the cost of all the lumber and the screws, we calculated it to be about $170, right in that range give or take a few dollars, depending on how much you paid for lumber, you know, how many screws you needed, if you're only buying one. So what, what we ended up doing is we, we bought enough lumber for four, and then bought a big box of screws and stuff, and just divided that number by four to get our cost per bed. 
But if you're not doing it out of redwood, you're not, you're not making it nearly as fancy, you could do this probably for on the plan without, you know, without things that said, you could probably go as low as 60, 50, $60 probably for lumber. If you're using Douglas fir or pine or something, um, redwood and cedar are certainly more expensive. And so that it does increase the cost, but I think it increased the longevity. And then depending on what you do with the staining and stuff, we intend these to be in the garden. We hope they're in the garden a very long time. And so we, we spent just a little bit more to make them as nice as possible. So let me continue to put the screws in here. Sorry, I'm hiding behind the, the wall here. Just give me a second and put a couple more screws and we'll turn it sideways. Okay, so with, with that done, now what we can do is we can just simply turn this sideways. So, um, I'll, I'll take these boards out of there because we don't need those. So for the last piece of this to get my, to get my bed where I want it, I am going to have to put the screws in with it being sideways. And uh, so I'll start with the two by two on the bottom and just kind of work my way up. So I've got two more, two more two by two, two, excuse me, two by sixes already cut here. So I will just, and sorry with the camera angle, you may not see this as good as you possibly could. But again, I'll just do the same thing. I'll drill just a quick pilot hole. Actually that one has one in it, but. So I'll just drill a quick pilot hole. And then we just do one board at a time and work our way up. This is why I put the boards upright because I felt like it was just easier than trying to, trying to do these while they're, while they're upright or while they're, you know, you're building it as you go. It's just, I think a little easier to do it when you're pushing down and sliding. So there's that one. I've got one more two by eight. We'll just put that in there. Try to make sure it's snug as possible. I'll just drill a couple, couple holes here. I have one already in that board and I have one in this board already as well, so. Occasionally, I, you know, with uh, the way these are, you, if you lose a little grip or something, sometimes you can strip, uh, strip the screws. So be careful with that. Okay, I've got two of those on. I've got my last two by six here. I just put that up nice and snug in there like that. I've already drilled a couple holes on this one. So I will just put the screws in here. If not, you're drilling. Whoops. Not, then you go ahead and drill those holes. And one more screw. These, the screws we're using for today's project are two and a half inches. You could go with a three inch screw. So this is, this is what we're using. It's a number 10, two and a half inch screw. And it looks like this. Um, some people might want to use a three, um, but considering that each of these boards is really only an inch and a half wide, um, if you use a three and you sink, countersink it just a little too deep, 
you might end up actually poking the tip of that out the other side. So that's why I used a two by or two and a half inch screw for this, because it's not uncommon for redwood's kind of a soft wood as far as uh, putting screws in it. It's not uncommon for that to go in at least an extra eighth of an inch, kind of as you as you set the screws. So two and a half it works really well. Okay, so here we are with our basic our basic structure. Now um, with what we decided to do, you could. So I've got the two by eights here. You could simply, there's enough surface area on the corners. You could probably just put these on the way they are and just anchor them. But because again, I don't wanna really see screws, um, it's, it's anchoring them. Now, if you have a pocket drill or something where, um, where you can do a, an angled hole and, and do that, you could, and the plan actually calls for that. You don't need to do any of that. Well, to make this easier um, to put the top on to anchor it from the backside, what I'm going to do is I'm adding one more, one more little step, and it's using a two by two again. Um, and actually, I think now that this bed, this whole bed is built, to make this easier, I'm going to kind of flip it up and on, on its sides, so I'm applying pressure down. But what we're going to do is we're just going to apply one extra little layer right up here on this top edge. And that gives plenty of good surface area for the top to rest on so it's not teetering, it's not really wobbly. You've got a good, a good piece of surface area right here for that to rest on. So I've already pre-cut these to fit right between. So those fit just nice and snug. So with that, I think we'll, let me, let me set those up here. I'll just turn, I'll just lift this up and I'll kind of just be working just right on the edge. So that, you know, that just stands up just fine. And so what I'll do is the same thing, same thing I've done with all these others. I'll just get the board, throw it in there. Because this is a little longer, this is I think about 50, not 50, 37 inches. The whole thing from outside to outside is four feet, it's 48 inches. This is about a 37 inch piece and I'm gonna put four screws in it. So I'll give you a four pilot holes. Just again to keep it keep it from splitting out. You know, I apologize that this this takes a little time. I hope you're not getting too bored as you watch us put this together. Uh, but we're just about to get the top on this thing, and then and then we'll be done. You could literally on a Saturday start this project. I guess, or depending on your schedule now. Within just a couple hours, you can start, get the lumber cut, build it, and put soil in it all in the same day. So there's the one side. So this is easy. This, this is not super heavy at this stage, but you wanna be careful, because again, it's just anchored with those cleats, which are just two by twos. So you just wanna carefully, you know, turn that to the other side, and we'll do the exact same thing with this one. We'll just quickly drill four holes. Get this screwed together. Sometimes boards will squeak like that. It's kind of loud. Okay. I should say, if I was cutting all this, you know, use your safety equipment, wear some safety goggles, you know, do, do things that are safe so you don't get yourself hurt or anything. If you're worried about slivers, definitely wear some gloves. When you're messing with raw wood, it's, it's pretty common and easy to get a sliver. OK, 
Okay, we're almost there on these. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got just one more side to do with this, this little top piece. And then I'll show you how to put the top on it. And then you're out putting it in your garden and getting your stuff going. Now, some of you might be asking, you know, I'm not using a, I'm not using a square or anything. Um, when I pre-cut all the lumber, I took a little more time on the first one to make sure everything would go together. And for the most part, it comes out to be pretty square. But as I said, it's not rocket science. So it's, if you're a tiny bit off, if, it depends. If you're very meticulous and you have to have it exact, then take time and use a square. Make sure everything, everything is squared up. Otherwise, it comes out really close. Okay, so there we have it. That's the main, the main structure is done. Now we're gonna be ready to do the top. So I'm gonna just push this bed out of the way just a little, and this one back just a little. Because so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be ending up turning this upside down. I'm gonna make the top, because of my mitered angles, the 45 degree angles, we're gonna actually kind of assemble that to the ground, not to the ground, on the ground so they hook together. And then we're just gonna put this bed right on top of it. And because I put these, again, these little brace pieces, we'll be anchoring the top from the bottom side so that you don't see any screws. And it, it makes it really attractive. If you didn't care about that, you didn't care about seeing screws, you could skip that step altogether and you could really just anchor, you know, set your bed up, put these right on top and screw them right to that board. And it would turn out just fine. It's just about seeing the screws. Okay, so we gotta hurry. Foam battery's getting low. So we'll, we'll lay these out. I want the best side down, again, because it's the side we're gonna see. So best side down. And I connect these, I just kind of basically am laying these out. Um, if your angles are nice, you've got a good 45 degree angle, these will match up really well. And this is the best way I found to try to get the angles together, as well as, you know, making sure, and then we can fit the bed on top of it to make sure it's squared up. So to make sure they're square, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use one screw, I'm, well, to actually just to kind of keep them together so they don't move as I go around. I'm just gonna drill a little hole on one side and I'm gonna put a screw in. Now, granted, you see the screw on the side, but this really helps keep it all together so that that corner stays nice as I, as I work around the others, okay? So we'll go over to this one, making sure that we try to match up the mitered edges as best we can. This one has a little chip out of the corner, which is gonna be fine. Okay, so we'll quickly try to do this on the other one. We don't want our camera to die. We're using a cell phone and sometimes your batteries don't last very long.
So I've got one more, one more of these on this side. You know, the way I cut these, sometimes your angles aren't perfect either. It's really hard sometimes to get a perfect 45, depending on the tools you're using. But they go together pretty good. There's a little bit of a crack, and sometimes I had to flip these over with my saw and cut them. So basically, again, we're setting this. This is upside down. And we're just going to position this. Now the camera, the camera angles might be a little hard to see what I'm doing here. So you've got your 45 degree angle. What you're, on, what you're trying to do is, is line up the post exactly on that seam so that it goes right across at an angle. Are we okay? For a minute? For a minute longer and then we can jump back on a laptop here. So you kind of can just keep positioning around, moving it just a tad. If you need to tap it with a hammer a little bit, you're just checking your corners. So ideally, that 45 degree angle is matching up with this corner of your post on each corner here. So as you kind of go around and look at that, those match up really good and it's, and it's essentially square. Here's where you could use the square again if you needed. Square it all up. But because the top, the 45 miters fit together good on all corners, it's essentially square. The box is essentially square. So I need to do just a few pilot holes. This is going to be hard to see from where you are, but I'm going to do the pilot holes here. And again, I'm just going to, probably for the sake of the video, I'll, I'll just put three screws in. I'll drill the, I'll drill the holes, and maybe I'll just do two of each. I'm going to flip it over so you can see it, and then I'll put these in. I'll finish it up after. But while it's upside down, I'll go ahead and drill all the holes. Okay, so I've drilled pilot holes, four holes on each side. I'm just gonna put in two screws on each side for now, just so we can turn it over. And while I'm in here in the corner, I can just... Just do one in each corner on each side. Just a few more screws. We'll just do two more and we'll turn this thing over. So for now, like I said, we'll just turn this over. I'll add the other screws later just to make sure it's complete. So at this point, it's really solidified. The, you know, you screwed it together. It's not gonna bend very much, so it's quite sturdy. And, you know, we can flip this thing over. I'll turn it this way so you can kind of see the front, or the top, I mean. So, you know, there you have it on the front. What it looks like from the front. And then we can just turn this thing over. And there you go. So you got your raised bed. Now, if you had a sander or something and you're worried about the corners being a little sharp, you could take out an orbital sander or something, sand off the corners. I kind of did that on this first one. Um, out of breath. Just sand off the corners a little bit. If, you're, if their edges aren't completely good here, you can also sand those a little bit. Um, I noticed my seams didn't, it was because of my mitered edges. They're not 100% perfect, if you have a little bit better saw than I have. 
you'll probably get that. If you're using a circular saw, you're gonna always be off just a tad. It's really hard to make perfect 45 cuts. So um, with that, I think as far as the demonstration goes, that pretty much sums it up. So Janice, are there questions? Yes. Janice will shoot the questions and I'll stand here and talk about them. Yeah, so we, we, if anybody has questions, um, ask them right now. Someone raised their hand. This is, just type your question in the Q&A box and, and what we can answer them. Um, there is one question, if you're looking at doing a very long raised bed, so this person specifically is gonna do a four foot and they're looking at doing a 28 foot long bed, so mm -hmm. quite long, um, and 12 to um, 28 inches deep, um, how would you recommend supporting the sides to keep the integrity and strength of the sides? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, if, yeah, if you're doing longer beds, even eight foot beds, the weight of that soil can tend to maybe bow them out a little bit. So you can put other boards. It can be a two by four. You don't necessarily need a full wall in the middle, but you could anchor just a couple of other boards. Now you'd have to probably either screw from the side or put the cleats in the inside and screw to those. But you basically put other boards in the mid middle of the section. Um, if, you know, usually you can go eight feet and it's not a problem. My eight foot beds at home, they're not bowing. They're, I use two by sixes and they're, they're doing pretty good. Um, so I would say probably every eight foot, eight foot length in a, in a longer bed, a 20, 28 foot bed, just put, either build a full wall in there so you have sections partitioned or just put a couple two by fours at the joints of your, of your boards. So going up the side, you have one here and here. And so that allows movement, water movement, soil movement through, but you're maintaining the integrity so you don't get a bow. That's a great question. And then there's just one other one and it's very specific to a self-watering pot or self-watering bed. A self-watering bed? Yeah, do you know anything about those, Dave? I'm not very familiar with um, So it's already a pre-built bed that you like has a, has a reservoir and it's supposed to water from the bottom, I'm supposing maybe? I'm not sure. Um, there's some self-watering containers that are fairly large that they actually have a reservoir underneath and a wicking material, some sort of fabric or something that, so that as the soil dries up, it's actually wicking water up. Just similar principle to maybe what trees do is they're pulling water up. Cap the capillary action of water is able to move against gravity. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with those. So if they're having difficulty with it wicking properly or something, it's either the nature of the soil, soil properties are such that it just, the capillary action and the cohesion of water isn't sticking to the soil. Um, that could be one of the issues. If if that's the issue, you know, change your soil. So are we out of video? Well, time? for some reason the camera flipped. Oh. So you're on oh. your side. I'm upside down. Oh, and it paused. So maybe okay. you can just come and answer I'll, them on this side. I'll come back over to the laptop here just a second okay. and we can answer more so questions. So there's just one more, but Dave, you can, you can go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the other question, um, so is this, let's see, the self-watering needs we've looked into so far require plastic at the bottom of the bed. Um, I, I did. I'm good, yeah. Pond liner, I wonder, can they hear me here? Nope, I'm mute. There we go. I hope you can hear me now. Okay, so I, I guess we already addressed that self-watering. Let's see, requires plastic at the bottom of the bed. Um, one of the things listed was um, and no, no, the class of the plastic, let's say, is there a different way of self-watering? I guess I'm not familiar with what the self-watering requirements. Um, so I think I'm seeing Janice here. I'm not sure. I hope you guys are seeing me and not Janice walking away with her phone. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I'm not familiar with the self-watering beds maybe that you're talking about. I, if it's a drip, drip irrigation, you know, I don't know that why you would need plastic at the bottom. If it's just some sort of reservoir that you're not gonna get away with anything else. It'll be a reservoir on the bottom that'll be some sort of a plastic wicking water upward. Um, it's a little different because you're not worried, you're not as worried about drainage necessarily, I guess. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure. I just don't know how else to answer that because it's wicking upwards and not downwards. You usually don't have worry, worries about the drainage issue. You're filling the reservoir. I've seen it in small pots, but never in a big raised bed um, where it, it wicks up. And so as long as that reservoir is full underneath, you always have sufficient water for the bed. 
So I guess I'll leave it at that. If there's another follow-up, ask the follow-up. The pond liner at the bottom, um, perforated pipe, fill with water, then plant self-water. Yeah, it's, I guess it's something similar. Yeah, you fill it up with water and then it, it wicks itself out. So that's a great comment. Are there other questions um, that, that we can answer or, or address? This was intended to be um, a self, kind of a, kind of a hand, would, if we would do this live here, we would have your participation. We may have you help us build some of these. And this was just try to give you an idea of how to build a bed. Um, the most, you know, some one method, one way, one plan. There's numerous plans, numerous ways to do this stuff. Um, so this hopefully is just one way to show you how to do it. So if you're excited about raised beds, you can get out and do that. So I guess I don't see any other questions. Um, hold on, let me scroll down because there may be a question I missed. Let's see, this video explains. Okay, somebody had posted a link. Explain what we came across. Um, I'll look at that link um, as far as the self-watering things and, and try to follow up with, with you, Hillary. So I think that's it. There were a few comments. Appreciate you joining us. Look for the other classes. Next week we're doing LocalScape, a LocalScape University. If you're not familiar with LocalScapes, it's a it's a principle-driven course about how to loc how to landscape for our locality based on our soils, our temperatures, our climate, and to make it really attractive. It's planned, it's well planned out yard areas, planned grass, planned beds, planned activity zones, and so forth. So if you if you haven't heard anything about that, join us for um, the LocalScapes and then look on our website for the additional classes. And with that, I think we're gonna just sign off. We'll leave the meeting. If you have other emails, you've got Janice and my email address, jterry at weberbasin.com and drice at weberbasin.com. We'd be happy to try to answer individual things that way. So thanks again for joining us and have a good afternoon. Have a good weekend.